students. Candy uh, has a BA from UNH in English Literature. She has a master's from Plymouth State University as a reading specialist, as well as certification as a school administrator. And then in addition, she from PSU, she has a certificate of advanced graduate studies. Candy taught sixth grade in Stratton for three years and then middle school in English in inner city Baltimore for three years. She then took time away from work to raise her children and returned to PSU as a graduate assistant to Dr. Denise Maslikowski. In 1990, she taught as an adjunct professor at PSU and started teaching fifth grade language arts at Plymouth Elementary School, where I think a lot of you know her. And before becoming assistant principal at Plymouth Elementary School from 99 to 2005, and then became assistant superintendent at SAU 48 until her retirement in 2013. And both are actually still working, so <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm going to start by talking about what a standard is. A standard is what students are to learn at a given grade level. It can be in reading, it can be in math, it should be in social studies and science as well. So any kind of learning that children do, there are standards that tell us what they should be learning at that grade level. It doesn't tell us how they should be learning it. It doesn't tell us what piece of equipment or book we should be using, but it does tell us what the expectation is that the child will learn at that particular time in their life. That is what curriculum is all about. Curriculum is not the books or the programs that are used to teach curriculum, but the curriculum are the standards itself. Standardized testing comes in a wide variety of, of forms, and most recently in the state of New Hampshire, you're familiar with NECAP, and this year, Smarter Balanced. And we'll talk about those later as we go through. The, both of those tests are a one-time test that happens once a year. Um, in many of our school districts, they are using other standardized tests so that they get a feel for how their children are doing throughout the year. NWEA, Northwest Evaluation Association, is one test that's frequently used. Um, in reading, there's a ver wide variety of tests that are used. And STAR program is another program that is recently being used by some of the districts in the state. From there, I'd like to kind of, and do you want to add anything to what I've just? Nope. nope. OK. Doing them all. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of where all these federal programs and Common Core state standards came from. For the past 50 years, the United States has been concerned about the education system and how our children are doing, and probably longer ago than that. But in 1965, you have President Johnson who has his war on poverty and passes the Elementary Secondary Act, which is commonly known as Title I. The purpose of that program was to provide funding to low-income districts with, so that they could provide supplemental services to their students. This act was reauthorized seven times until it morphed into No Child Left Behind in 2001. And I'll give you a little bit more history about No Child Left Behind when we get there. But we're only in 1965 at this point. You had President Reagan who formed a commission mainly because they thought it was time to investigate the system of our education and how we were doing. There were certainly concerns about how industry and commerce were having problems with Japan, South Korea, and Germany out producing us, making quality materials for a lot less money. They believed that education would be the great equalizer. The commission published A Nation at Risk, and their findings stated that American students were far behind most of the industrial world as far as their education went. 23 million adults were considered to be functionally illiterate. 13% of 17-year-olds were supposed to be functionally illiterate. And of those 13%, 40% were minorities. SAT scores showed an overall decline in verbal scores of 50 points and 40 points in math. And that was between 1963 and 1980. Most of your public four-year colleges were finding that they had to increase the number of remedial math courses by 72% to help those students that were coming to them get ready for college math. 
Overall, it found that students were neither ready for college or for work. The findings promoted that the federal government needed to support science and math, High schools were expected not to have minimum standards, but high standards, and the federal government was expected to financially support state and local governments in paying for education. Well, we all know that that didn't happen. During President Clinton's tenure, Goals 2000 Educate America came about. And with that, the goal of that program was to help preschool education and school-to-work opportunities in which there were grants available for schools to join partnerships with industry to help students see what they could expect to do when they left the classroom and to provide real-world applications to what they were learning in college. When President Clinton left, that grant pretty much dried up and everything that had happened with it sort of went the way of the world. In 2001, we're back to No Child Left Behind. This bill received bipartisan support, and I think it's important that Senator Edward Kennedy and Judd Gregg sponsored it in the Senate, and um, John Beener and George Miller sponsored it in the House. This act came along with a lot of things in it was the annual testing of students in third through eighth grade and 11th grade, but the testing was to be determined by the state. They were to report on the subgroups, that means the boys, the girls, the, the ESOL students, the minority students, those students that were special ed, and it was the expectation that by 2014, all students would be on grade level. Um, the act set goals for schools and districts, which they had to meet. If they didn't meet it, then, they, then sanctions were um, addressed to them. Um, all teachers had to prove that they were highly qualified. It became evident that most schools, if not all, would be sanctioned in the end. That Title I bill is still in operation today. It has not been changed. But with President Obama's administration, we have the race to the top. This came along with states having to agree to certain expectations to qualify for even applying to the funding. It included a statewide evaluation system for teachers and administrators, the development of a rigorous cur curriculum, and better assessment. Data-driven decision-making was to be a part of it and there would be rigorous interventions for low-performing schools. Out of this program is where the Common Core Standards are born, and with them two national tests, Smarter Balance and PARC. Right. Yep. And I'm going to let you talk about some of the other implications that helped um, to bring it. And you are free to ask, raise your hand and ask any questions as we, as we go along, if anyone has um, anything that occurs to them. Susan and I will probably be talking back and forth because we sit and talk about this and that's how we do it. Um, I also brought Common Core Standards for English Language Arts and Math for anyone that wants to look at them. We realize that when people talk about the Common Core, they sort of put it in this huge category. And really, the Smarter Balance Park testing is different than the Common Core standards. Um, there, was the, there was a study done by ACT, the testing, that was the forerunner to some of the philosoph philosophical development of the Common Core standards. ACT has been collecting and reporting on students' academic re readiness for college since 1959, and it has maintained those longitudinal studies on all high school graduates who take the ACT test. This year, 57% of high school graduates took the ACT test. In 2006, and if you follow Susan's timeline, you can see where it fit into this, they published a report called Reading Between the Lines. And all of us who were in administrative positions in school, public schools really read that carefully. And it really is the basis for the standards that were set in terms of where we should be going. And what they were concerned about is exactly what Susan just spoke about, and that's the readiness of our high school students 
to go into college and also into careers. And you're going to hear college and career ready over and over again when people talk about the Common Core Standards. Um, their report talked about the percentage of students who were not ready for college having to take remedial courses in English language arts and math and leading to a greater dropout percentage. And they also kept track of not how many students entered college, but how many, as best they could tell, that finally graduated, which is a far more telling thing about our public schools, I believe. Um, what they figured out is that students have great difficulty with dense, close, content-related texts. When they had to read a science book, a history book, that's what we call dense text. And it was very, very difficult for many of them to do that. Students were also having difficulty writing logically, using a synthesis of materials from multiple sources. Also, the use and understanding of academic language, which is very, very important to their success when they reach e the college level. Um, we also, they also looked at how many students were ready for careers. They, by the way, this was two-year, four-year college and career ready. And things have changed considerably. I started teaching, it makes me sound really, really old, in 1969. Um, the classroom, our schools have changed in the last 20 years. They have changed so much. And being ready for a career, any career, is requiring that you have some rigorous academic standards. Just think about when you go to your auto mechanic. They're using a computer to diagnose the car. Um, electricians are having to read manuals that, again, are that need that dense, close reading. So things really, really needed to change. I got the statistics from ACT for 2014, and this is their college benchmarks for readiness. 64% of the students were ready for English, 44% in the reading, math 43%, and science only 37%. So we have a lot of work to do. And the ACT recommendations fit very closely to what Susan was talking about. Fewer but essential college and career standards for education and for graduation. Rather than try to cover everything, fewer standards that go into depth more. A rigorous core curriculum, just as she was speaking about, for all students, college-bound, career-bound. And strengthening, strengthening the rigor of that curriculum. And that's what you will hear over and over again tonight. Also, early monitoring of the students using target goals, which goes back to the Smarter Balanced or PARC testing and other tests. And this one is something that really turned out to be quite important in terms of accountability. Longitudinal P, preschool through 16 data systems to monitor that progress. So this really was the ACT test and all of the legislation that's been passed is really what led to the Common Core Standards. Um, we're not going to go into depth about the math and the English language arts standards, but we are going to give you an overview so you understand some of the shifts that we have educationally and academically gone through for these standards, and Susan's going to talk about math. But first I'm going to talk about where they got the Common Core. They were building on existing state standards. They were clearer and more consistent goals to help prepare students for, like Kathy said, for college, career, or life. This, the standards clearly demonstrate what a student is expected to learn at a given grade level. And it's supposed to be nationwide, so regardless of where your child is, they have to meet those same standards. In the past, and we have a lot of moving around in the district that I worked with, in Winnesquam, which is Tilton, Samberton, and um, Northfield, and I know that Kathy and I have spoken together that the same thing happens right. in the Plymouth area. Kids pop from school to school and back again. This assures that the curriculum is the same, and if they move to Mississippi, it's the same down there. The standards are the same regardless of where the child lives. Um, the standards are research-based, they're clear, understandable, 
and consistent. They align with college and career expectations. They're based on rigorous content and application of knowledge through higher order thinking skills. They're built upon the strengths and lessons of current state standards, and they're informed by other top performing countries who prepare their students for the global economy and society. What the Common Core is doing by lowering the number of standards that students need to meet is hoping that there's more time for them to reach mastery. Mastery has a different definition, though, of what you might think it is. It's not just learning a fact. It's learning how to use that fact when presented with a problem. Um, and now I'm going to talk about the math standards and how they've changed what was currently happening in New Hampshire. The key word is focus. The, Common Core Standards calls for a better focus in mathematics. Rather than racing through topic after topic after topic, a mile wide and an inch thick, teachers are asked to narrow their focus and to deepen the time and energy spent in the classroom. This means focusing deeply on the major work in each grade level as follows. In grades kindergarten through second grade, concepts, skills, and problem solving are related to addition and subtraction. In grades five through, or three through five, concepts and skills and problem solving are related to math and division of whole numbers and fractions. In sixth grade, ratio and proportional relationships and early algebraic expressions and equations. In grade seven, you have ratios and proportional relationships and the arithmetic of rational numbers. And by eighth grade, you're ready for algebra. This focus helps students to have a strong foundation. It gives them a solid understanding of concepts, a high degree of procedural skills and fluency, and the ability to apply the, the math that they've learned to solve problems both inside and outside of the classroom. There is the expectation that students will not only master their math facts, but they'll know how to use those skills to solve a problem and that they will be able to explain how they reached that solution. Kathy, or Susan, yeah. a question. You're saying this is standardized across the country, but I'm thinking of Native American populations way out in the rural west, our inner city kids like the Baltimore issues, the deep south, the rural west, the rural north country. How are you, or how are these being adjusted for this? And we know there are inadequate teachers, inadequate funding, lack of supplies, buildings. The how is this being met to standardize it? I, I don't, it is not standardizing the, how it's being taught, but it's standardizing what is being taught. And the expectation. And the expectation. Yeah. And if the schools are not meeting this because of these circumstances, you know, it's very difficult because one of, we're going to talk about our concerns about this. And this thing. is definitely one and of our concerns. And this is one of our concerns because the Common Core does not, just, does not address special needs, does not address ESL students, English as a second language students. Um, there are a lot of things that, and it doesn't, and it definitely, unlike many people say, it doesn't tell you how to teach them. And obviously, when you run into those circumstances, as Barbara said, I taught in inner city Baltimore for three years. I understand just what you're saying. And Susan and I have talked a lot about the, just what you're talking about. You can't apply a one-size-fits-all no. model to education. We're talking about human lives. We're talking about children who come in with no breakfast, children who have, um, <coughs> many teachers are sitting here, you know just what I'm talking about, children whose family was fighting the night before, even children whose cat died that morning or whatever. So, you, and I always get upset when people try to apply the business model to education. It doesn't work because we're talking about children and humans. So, what your, your question is a great question and I'm not sure we can exactly no. answer it. And as you know, sometimes even in the state of New Hampshire, the towns where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, that's where we see that inequality. 
And many times, and I love it when great teachers go to places that are tough to teach in, but many times that doesn't happen. So that's an issue. That is an issue, and we're, we are going to talk about something. Right, and I mean, we were talking at the dinner table tonight what it means to buy a new program, like a new reading program for a small district. For the district that I was in, and we had about 1,500 students, and I would say about 800 of them were in the elementary grades, to buy a new reading curriculum cost about $300,000. Well, how many times can you buy a new reading right. curriculum? Um, and what changes are you going to need to make so that that uh, reading program, I'm sorry, reading program so that that it will adapt to the standards that you have. And, and it takes a while for the students that are maybe in third or fourth grade to catch up with those that are in kindergarten first and second who are beginning a new program that the others have not had. So I mean, those types of questions aren't going to go away regardless no. of what the standards are. Just the are. cost of professional development for teachers as you work through the Common Core and what the expectation that's expensive. Professional de development is very expensive. Yes. So those are the things that, as administrators, we have to look at and figure out how are we going to do it within the budget that we have. And it's not going to happen overnight. This is a long-term looking at it. But as you can tell from what Susan was talking about, politically, as teachers sometimes, you feel like you're being pulled one direction and pulled another direction because there have been many changes over time. I don't think there's a teacher that I know that thought in 2014 we were going to have 100% proficiency amongst our students. It just didn't make sense. Think about the population you were just asking the question for. So those are all monetary questions. And it, and it also surprises me when you hear who is supporting the bill. Right. Um, no Child Left Behind. Um, that bill, who was supporting it wouldn't be the people that you would expect would have said, oh yeah, 2014, everybody's going to be at grade level. Right. <laughs> um, and I would just throw in, I think those are the issues that Martha has brought up are long before Common Core. Right. Absolutely. And at least Common Core gives us the goal and gives us the standard that we're looking for for everyone because we, you mentioned it before, we are in a, a geographically transient group and we can't afford to have our kids that used to live in Littleton and lived in Littleton for their entire lives and now don't. We need to have we need to have standards that are universal. Well and the problem is as a teacher, my many years of teaching, a student transfers in on November second. Right. You have no there's idea. a huge you have no idea. There's no testing to back it up and you have a huge gap. Right. Perhaps between the school that you're presently in and the school that the child was in before. And how do you make up that gap? And we have students in SAU 48, we had students that would move three or four times a year. Yes. That's a lot. That is very upsetting even for the student, but you can imagine the teacher just looking at it. So the standards are helpful in that respect, absolutely. And we have families that both parents work just to keep shelter over their over their family's head and, and, and to be able to pay for food and for heat and all of those sorts of things. So how much time at the end of the day do you have to spend that extra few minutes going over homework? And is homework that relevant? I mean, we've had that conversation as yeah, well. That's a constant conversation. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Many no, and I didn't mean to say that, that all parents aren't, but I think that there are those cases where parents are just scraping by and, and to expect them then to do extra above and beyond, you know, it's so hard to have those expectations. Are you? I'm done. Okay, <laughs> I'm just going to give an overview for English language arts. I'm not going to get into the grade levels, but I think if you go back to what I was telling you about the ACT testing, you can kind of see where it's coming from. I love English language arts and I really feel that the common core standards for reading, writing, speaking, listening, I forgot one. Vocabulary. Vocab language. I think they're very good standards. I really do. They're not, despite what you read, it doesn't tell you what you have to read, and it doesn't tell you how you have to teach it. But the idea from it is that reading, writing, speaking, listening, and language 
is a shared responsibility within the school. As an English teacher, I used to look at a report for a science teacher, or not picking one, Emily, for any teacher other than English, and I'd say, What's, what are all these problems in here, grammatical mistakes? And they would say, well, it's for our history teacher. He doesn't care about how we do in English. For you, I'll do it. That's not the way, that's not, no longer acceptable. It's not, when we talk about career ready, that's not acceptable in the job market and it's not acceptable in schools anymore. And it's not exactly what we read, but how we read, which goes back to the dense text and the close reading. Um, in, English, in English language arts, we are what we found is students have a difficult time with nonfiction text, with those textbooks. So they are asking that more and more of the knowledge is built through those nonfiction texts, whether it's in science, social studies, the arts, technology, that students are able to use those textbooks. Reading, and this is, is really emphasized throughout it, reading, writing, and speaking should be grounded in evidence from the text. Students should no longer just say, because I think it's so. Where is the evidence? Is this a logical paper that's using text-based evidence? And um, we're talking about both literary text and informational text. And students will have both a literal and an inferential understanding of the material. And that, I really think that transfer from reading to writing the synthesis of the facts that they have read about is such an important higher order learning. And it really, really is something that we're trying to emphasize. In the Common Core, they do give examples of suggested reading that they could, that teachers can use, classic myths, America's founding documents. They really emphasize primary sources now. And I've been working at Plymouth High School using, with curriculum with the teachers and they use those computers and find primary sources. They're doing a lot more than I ever did when I was in high school using them. And a range of balanced literature from fiction and nonfiction. The suggestion is K to six, 50-50, fiction and nonfiction. When they get to high school, heavier on nonfiction. But again, when I originally said all content areas, it, the English teachers can still teach their fiction, but we're asking the other teachers to help with the nonfiction, which is not easy. And there are a lot of standards for, we have national science standards, national history standards. There's a lot on the plate of our teachers these days, a whole lot. Writing should emphasize logical argument writing with evidence grounded in text and using information from a variety of sources and not Wikipedia. We have to teach our students to use both the technology and actual textbooks and have them go out and find that variety of sources and to make connections from their previous knowledge and synthesize the information. And most importantly, when you read about the Common Core, they're talking about our students need to make real world connections. They need to see how they could apply this knowledge when they're out in the real world, when they get a job. And um, that's a huge part of it. We're, not, we're really trying to teach our, our students to problem solve. That's really what it comes down to. How can you personally solve this problem? And there is an emphasis on collaboration and group work. And there's an also an emphasis on when they get the information, and research projects are a huge way of doing it, is a formal presentation using technology. That's the whole speaking and listening, two skills that are not often well used in many of our, in, for many of our students. Um, the whole idea of collaborating is really emphasized, and some of you probably, I know you know, that in the work world today, whether you're an engineer, a teacher, lawyer, you have to be able to collaborate. You have to be able to speak as a group and problem solve together. Um, talking to some of the students who had gone to engineering school, 
that was a huge part of being learning how to be an engineer was how do you solve a problem as a group? And we know that many of our current technology um, companies, that's, that's how they do everything. And another thing that has not been thrown out the window that I hear sometimes, grammatical conventions are expected and will be taught. <laughs> They really are. Now, we always get questions about cursive writing. You always hear that. And we talked about multiplication <laughs> yeah. tables. I think when yes, you heard was... Susan talking, you realized those things are taught. Um, cursive writing is taught in most of our schools, but that's a local decision to make. That really is. Because of, there is an awful lot of technology used in the schools today. Um, a lot of the real life applications, last week I was at Plymouth High School observing a chemistry teacher who had a lab experiment, typical lab experiment, except she formed a company and challenged the students to, fall, to solve a real life world problem using their lab and extending it and doing a presentation with a computer as a group. Exactly what we're talking about. And it's, it's amazing what the kids can come up with. They really, and that's the, that really is based on the Common Core standards, absolutely. So, any questions on English language arts? I could talk on it forever, yes. Uh, it's been my understanding that you have kind of a generation of teachers that themselves didn't really learn a lot about grammar. Mm. So, will there need to be professional development for teachers to, if they're gonna have an increased emphasis on grammatical convention, how will they be supported to do that for professional development? You know, it's hard for me. I, local schools will have to do that. And I think another piece that I put in the problem solving is pre-service at the college level. Those kind of expectations for grammatical correctness. I've always emphasized it, but I know we have teachers that have not been. It, you probably have run I into do. that too. Yeah. And I always yeah. bring it to their attention. It, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. My daughter's a fifth grade teacher right now, and um, she was diagramming sentences, which is something that I did as a student. Um, and she understands well the need for understanding how sentences go together and how to make them and how to be a part of them. I just finished teaching Foundations of Reading and Writing at Plymouth State, which is an undergraduate course dealing with how do you teach writing to students. and. Um, I was using as part of what we do is the convention of writing. So it's hard when you have one, three, you know, 30 hour course to do all of foundations of reading and writing. I think that there is that need to do more. I would always be supportive of anything we can do to emphasize grammar. And you know, it's very difficult. I listen to sporting programs. Um, I don't know how many people start a sentence with me. I see your on social media spelling correct. It, I have some problems with it. And, I think, and so I think that you're right. We need to emphasize it more. I really do agree with you. Fran? And I think we would both agree with you. Absolutely. I think it's equally important, too, that they know how to do their basic math. Yeah. And I agree totally. I'm sure Susan's done the same thing. I've sat with 60 resumes in front of me, and I see a mistake, a grammatical mistake, or even a typo. It's Out. gone. You got 60. Why would you accept that? Right. So yeah, might go away with your generation. I mean, I don't. I, I don't so. think so. When you're hearing the kids do this stuff, and they can't speak, they can't look in the eye, they can't shake your hand. It drives me crazy. Are they reading books? When you say no Wikipedia, are they going to an actual hardcover book for other research? I, I really worry about this next well, generation. Well, you know what? Libraries... Paying my social security with a lousy job. <laughs> <laughs> Libraries have become media centers. Libraries and librarians are very, very important in the Common Core, especially in research part of English language arts. There is a lot of more technology expected, but our media People, our librarians, are the ones that are really working with just what you're talking and about. And the kids go seek out this help or after? Yes. They do, Martha. They yeah, do. they do. They do. And I, I know for me, when I was at Winnesquam, one of the things that I did with my science teachers at the high school level is we developed a rubric for their, for their, um, their lab reports. Right. And on the lab report, we all reached consensus in what would be expected and what would not be accepted. <laughs> right. 
And from that, I, I had some teachers that said, would say, oh, my lower level kids can never make that. I had a, a teacher come back to me and said, you know what, Susan, I put those, those out there. I said, this is what you're expected to do. And you know what? They did it. So if, you're expect, if your expectations are low, that's what they're going to rise to. If you have high expectations, then they'll make their way there. It's your job as a teacher to help them figure out how to get there. I, I think for many, the big objection comes from those that don't understand what the standards are all about, mm -hmm. that they feel that you're not being told what to teach, but how to teach. And that is not the case. I had an interesting conversation with a person in Plymouth who was a homeschooler. And um, she and I were friends. Um, and I admire what she does with her kids immensely. And she was talking about the Common Core. And I said, have you read it? And she said, well, no. But I said, you need to read it. Because it's not telling you how to teach. It's telling you what to teach. Would you agree that your child needs to learn how to add and subtract by the end of second grade? Oh, yeah. How about multiplication and division and fractions? By the end of fifth grade, is that a reasonable expectation? Yep. That's what the Common Core was saying. Something that upsets me, and I was listening to some of the testimony at the state level, is the people who are against the Common Core, and I, I think they did read the Common Core, but they're saying those standards are low. I do not believe they're low. I've been teaching for a long time, and I've written curriculum. I've written standards. I do not really believe they're low. I think they're well thought out. Part of the issue, and Susan and I have talked about this, is people do not like race to the top, the two tests, park and smarter balance, being really forced in order to get federal money, mm -hmm. um, to get the race to the top money, and they don't want to be told. Many of these issues are at the federal level, not at our level. And um, I, I have no objection to the standards. We've always had standards. We've had standards for everything. I think it's just become one of those words that everybody gets upset. They are not low standards, I don't believe. Yes, what were you going to I think there's a difference between the standards, curriculum, and program. And they're often interwoven. So if I buy open court reading, for example, that's not a curriculum, that's a program. Book sellers, program makers, are basing what they're selling to people on the standards. A curriculum is when you take the standards as a school, you look at them and you might find that there's something missing. And then you add that piece to it. And then it becomes your own curriculum. You've used the standards, the common core standards, as your base, but you've tweaked it a little so it meets the needs because there may be something that was left out you know and we learn new things all the time so maybe that needs to be added in i think one of the good things about the common core is that it's a living document right that that it went through many many changes before it got to the state it was in i have every confidence that it will continue to evolve you know what, I think, I think when we talk about standardized testing, and I think having taught social studies for a lot of years, that's one place where I feel we've fallen down as a nation. Uh-huh. There aren't any standardized tests that are looked at for social studies. And civics. And geography. And all of those things that go into that social studies realm. Um, I think it's a huge mistake, personally. That's me speaking. Um, but when our country was founded, it was founded to have people that understood what our government was all about. Um, if you go back to Jefferson, he talks about how important it is. I mean, that's why we have an electoral college, because the common people couldn't be trusted to actually vote for who would be president. Um, I hope that we don't get back to that place again. 
I think it's really important that social studies in our history and our geography are part of what students are learning. And certainly it can be done in the informational text, part of it, but there needs to be an emphasis on its own. Right. We're going to talk about some of the positives and then we'll have a questioning. Um, we talked about that our society has changed. People move more and more, so having the standards allows us to at least have some kind of standardization in our expectations. The other thing is consistency from state to state. When no child left behind, when the rules were instituted, states were allowed to say what was proficient in their state. And I'm not going to pick on southern states, but there were a few states that their level of proficiency was much lower than our northeastern states. Our northeastern states had a much higher level. Therefore, our states didn't look as good when they were um, looking at the scores. Uh, preparation for a global society. I, I know some of you have children. They're not living in, they didn't grow up in Plymouth, New Hampshire and live in Plymouth, New Hampshire their whole lives. They're all over the world, actually. So we have to prepare our students for that global society. And having these standards, I think, will really help them. Um, use of technology for access to information and preparation for the workplace. And here's one that I heard at a conference I went to about a year ago. Education for a workplace that we can only guess about. What is the workforce going to look like in 20 years from now? Think about all the innovations that have happened in the last 20 years. Um, it's 2015, go back 20 years. Things have changed dramatically. And now the workplace has changed dramatically. More and more people are working from home. Things have definitely changed. So we have to educate our students for a job that we're not sure what it's going to be. So I think that that's a good reason for them to be taught that whole problem solving piece. And it is a key component in the whole common core. And the integration of the content areas, I really like to emphasize that because it has our students thinking critically and not just thinking in isolated subjects. We have to have them see all those connections. And I think that's really, really important. Want to add something? I, I wholeheartedly agree with all of what you've said. I, I think that, you know, we become smaller as the technology becomes greater. Um, and with that technology comes pluses and minuses. So, I mean, and I think <laughs> stealing of information, right, right. those types of things, but... And I think see. accountability is good for an education system. I think we should be accountable. Mm -hmm. When I first started teaching, I taught in my classroom, sixth grade, closed the door, and I was the queen of the classroom. And nobody bothered me, and you know what curriculum was? Whatever textbooks they had ordered for yep. that subject. We didn't have that accountability. I like accountability, and I think the Common Core and even Smarter Balance and Park, the other tests, do ho they hold us accountable, and we should be accountable for teaching our students. I think that's a positive. Yeah, and we've we've also talked that we've also talked about how schools are still. Perhaps we should lengthen the school day. Perhaps we should lengthen the school year. I know. I know. <laughs> But we have, it's not the society that it was when schools first came into existence. It, we were an agricultural country then, and we're not anymore. Um, and you see young families with, what do I do when I'm still working all summer with my child? And you see the deficits that children come back to school with in the fall because nothing happened for them during the summer. Um, is that realistic? Those are big changes that I think we as a society will eventually have to look at. Our concern, did you have anything else you wanted to no, add? No, I'm done. Our <laughs> concern, do you want to start with the challenges? And, and the te no textbook is going to cover all of your right. standards. Whether it was the New Hampshire standards or the Common Core standards, it just doesn't happen. It and, just doesn't happen. And more and more schools are not using one text. They're no. asking kids to go to multiple texts and technology, and we're not sticking with one 
one book. Um, the other piece that, if I were to say there was a challenge, and it's always the same challenge, I think, bottom line challenge is monetary support. Yep. Um, there, we have to have interventions for students that are below proficiency. As we talked about, we're dealing with a lot of social and economic problems in our schools. And this all, tech upgrades are a huge part, and I don't want to confuse Smarter Balance with Common Core, but the Smarter Balance takes technology. And we're not really getting the money for that technology. It's coming out of school budgets. And as right. you know, with technology, it changes all the time. So money is really huge in terms of professional development, changing textbooks, as Susan said, um, with the Common Core, especially in math, we've had to change many, many of our textbooks. So those all cause problems. Am I the only one who doesn't know what smarter balance is? It sounds like a diet. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> what is it? It's, a, it's, it's taking the place of kneecap. Yeah. Um, it's a test. It's a test. And it happens once a year. It happens in spring. On a computer. On a computer. Three through eight and 11. And it's a test. If any of you are familiar with NIWA testing, it's similar to NIWA in that students rise to a certain level. And you, you go on until you're frustrated, actually. Wouldn't you say? Have you? And the same thing with math. Yes. They would be given a problem to solve some of the facts, but they had the diagram. They had the plan. There was a lot, I'm right. sure you've seen. Yeah. Um, it takes a long time. And some of our students don't have that stick with itness to it took 13 hours per student. And when we're talking about listening, there are certain parts of the test where they watch a video and have to respond with, right with head, headphones. No, that's smarter, smarter balanced. balanced. And they do have a great website where you can see what some of the testing items look like. Right. I would highly recommend that you take a look if you're really, you know, if this is one of your passions, it will show you the type of questions that students have to answer. It's about 50-50 in the United States with PARC, P-A-R-C-C, and Smarter Balance. Some states chose to use Smarter Balance, some chose to use PARC. In the Northeast, I think Smarter Balance is more prevalent. But Massachusetts is doing and PARC. And right. your school is in alignment or not, or where you're failing? Well, where you're you're failing. well it's really new. We don't know. We yeah, exactly. finished it this week. What was your first time? This it's was really the first new. time. Oh. First time through, Mark. Sure. Yeah, and they not really. We're just finishing makeups this week. The window ends right. on Friday. So it's all new, and we're not sure how the. And I know that some be. districts started as early as as March. But unlike kneecap, where you had like I think it was ten day yeah. window, you have weeks for a window. So Months. You, because but each grade had windows within. That. Right, right. Yeah, it was because simple. if you don't have a lot of computers, you've got to. That's a huge part of it. Yeah. Is scheduling. Yeah. I, I think this is something that we've talked about too. But I think that, that it's a one day, one time test. And is that fair? Because what if the child's sick that day? What if you have difficulty taking a multiple choice type of test? Though there is far more writing in this test mm -hmm. than there were in right. others. It was definitely writing with my strong suit and the right. choice that you and this test, most students have to take. You have to have a severe disability not, not to take it. Well, teaching to the test is teaching to the standards. And that's what you should be doing, is teaching to the standards. And I remember back in 2001, when I was a teacher, saying, well, why am I going to teach to the test? It took me a while to figure out that I wasn't teaching to the test. I was teaching the standards. You do. Absolutely. And Karen, it is difficult. And having dealt as an administrator telling certain <coughs> elementary school teachers they can't do their penguin unit because we have to have a little more academic rigor did not make me a very popular person. And uh, that's how things have changed. The teachers are accountable also. So that's what I was talking about when I had my little classroom and I was queen of the classroom. That is no longer. And we're also asking our teachers to work collaboratively. There was a time that perhaps the second grade teacher didn't necessarily know what the third grade teacher was doing or the other second grade teacher. Now that's absolutely imperative. Right. 
they should be all on the same as much as possible, at least in terms of the standards. Talking about them, and and that doesn't mean you can't do great projects. Right. You can do great projects, um, and you can address the standards while Absolutely. doing those products. That's projects. why I talked about project-based learning. That's yeah. what it does. It takes all. It, you can do a great project. The kids love it. Right. They do a presentation, but you might have to throw away some unit that you've done forever. It, it is absolutely harder in high school than it is right. in elementary and middle yeah. school because you have students taking the same classes. Where in high school, it becomes a nightmare it because does. you have the it's schedule like this. The nightmare. Um, so I, I agree with you. I think that the hope would be that it would be get easier or less complicated. And the kids will get used to it also, which I think would be. And we're going to start teaching to the standards, so it's going to be a more familiar pattern for them. It's especially difficult. Oh, well, it's very difficult for high school teachers, especially AP, because they have their AP tests and they have 11th grade smarter balance. But as kids get used to it and they get used to the process of writing more in math and diagramming more, it, it hopefully will get easier. It is a problem. There's no doubt about it. I can just tell you that there's legislation in New Hampshire in the Education Committee to look at high school using SATs or, right. or ACTs um, as in, in place of Smarter right. Balance because those are some of the issues that they're finding and that's being discussed right, well maybe not right this moment, but it has been discussed this week and that's probably something that will go forward so they will keep smarter balance in the grades three through eight, and the high school will be either SATs or and ACTs. There's much better buy-in from high school students. High also. school kids are, are, and high school parents are more interested in, in kids doing. If things. you do that, the schools will have to pay for the SAT, or, or somebody's going to have. To somebody's going to have to pay. Came from the Governor's right. Association. Okay. Yes. Actually, the governors. The governors started. And actually, 48 out of the 50 states have accepted. I believe Texas and I know Texas and I think Alaska have not agreed to it. There are a couple things, though. The Smarter Balance and PARC, the, t the standardized testing, is required for some of the federal money. No, in the state of New Hampshire, you do not have to, the Department of Ed and the um, board adopted the Common Core standards, but the local districts do not have to. And I'm not sure what happened in Manchester. They were fighting the Common Core and were going to write their own standards that were more rigorous. They and did they? They just changed some of their words. Yeah, they, they, they changed some words. words. They, I, when I saw that and heard it, I thought they're going to still base it on the Common Core of standards. And then they weren't going to take the test, but I think they ended up taking the Smarter well, Balance. They did have to take the test. Yeah. Um, and I can tell you politically, Gary, and go back to that sort of thing, um, one of the real issues is New Hampshire is not a high stakes testing state. So as a, if I'm teaching sixth grade, my grades do not depend on whether on how the kids work. Because I'm more than willing to be judged on that as long as I can interview the parents in August. I don't even need to meet the kids. Let me meet the parents, and then I get to pick my class, and you can tell, and I'll, you can judge me any time. Yeah. But New Hampshire is not that. We had House Bill 101, which said that every no, no community or city or something like that was required to do take on Common Core. That already exists in New Hampshire. It went through the House, it went through the Senate, the governor vetoed it. So that it was vetoed. I can tell you that yesterday, when I was in Finance 2 and we were talking about uh, a bill that changed some of the CTE, which is the, uh, just a technical schools funding and advisory council, they added that bill back on to that. So it's going to go to the full finance committee on Tuesday and probably go to the Senate and be part of the uh, part of the uh, committee of conference when we fight about it in June. The other issue is we don't require common core, but we do require smarter balance. And I will tell you that the Department of Ed budget 
is 75% comes from the federal government. Right. Are you willing to give up 75% of your budget for the Department of Ed? Yeah, not a chance. So that part of it is required. I don't know exactly how they're going to deal with that on the governor's office because she's already vetoed one. I put a call into the governor's office. It's going to play out. We did it. Yeah, yeah, you did it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think we're all set. If you or you two are all okay, we're fine. We're, we're good. And, and I think if you have any other questions, Kathy and Susan said they'd stay good. <laughs>